Good afternoon, everyone. I think it's time to get started. The webinar today, the aim of the webinar today is to introduce PDF Toolbox 9, which is a major release of PDF Toolbox. Some of you might already have seen that version at uh, Drupa, but even for those people, I think there is some new stuff in there um, that you have not seen in the Drupa version that was a pre-release uh, version, of course. Uh, what you see on the agenda here is basically the topics that we are going to talk about. I'm not going to read through them. We'll tackle them uh, once by uh, one, one by one. So the first topic, uh, as you see, um, uh, talks about user interface, so wireframe, zoom, libraries. The uh, library stuff is perhaps a little bit uh, different, but wireframe and zoom are both items that talk about the user interface in uh, PDF Toolbox 9. So let me go to PDF Toolbox. And uh, as you can see, it does not look very different from what you uh, know in PDF Toolbox 8. But if I now open a PDF document, so let me just take something here. There we go. And um, if I go to View and Object Inspector, this is something that you uh, might remember from PDF Toolbox 8. Uh, Object Inspector is a feature that lets you uh, examine the different elements in a PDF document. So this was already there in PDF Toolbox 8, but in PDF Toolbox 9, at the very bottom of the Object Inspector, you see this new uh, item called uh, as a wireframe. And if I click that, my document is displayed in wireframe mode, which means that all objects are uh, either outlined or uh, are drawn as a, uh, a box. Uh, and different colors are used to indicate different objects. This sometimes makes it easier to see which content might be hidden between or after um, uh, images. So if I uh, go back here, um, if I go back here, you can see that uh, in this case, the image is not hiding anything, but the wireframe mode makes it easy to see what might be behind the objects that you have in a document. So if you're interested in document structure, if you're trying to figure out um, why something does not work, you can use that, and I can filter the objects that are shown uh, as well. And this actually works both in wireframe mode and in uh, the regular viewing mode. Um, in this case, I'm watching, I'm viewing my documents, but without any images uh, displayed. Yeah. And uh, so that makes, that lets me understand that what I see now in the background is in fact a shading. If I hide the shadings as well, uh, you see that background disappear, and then vector objects, and I also have some text objects. So it's a very quick way to identify um, how the document is uh, is built and find objects that might be causing uh, problems in there. So that's one. Um, secondly, what I can also do, and I can stay with the same uh, document to do so, what I can now also do is zoom inside of uh, the PDF toolbox window. As you probably know, um, it has always been so that if I do a shift drag in PDF toolbox, I get this loop window, and the loop window allows me to zoom in on a particular part of the uh, the document, but in PDF Toolbox 9, I can either use the menu items to zoom, or I can use Command plus, Command minus on uh, Mac at least. The keyboard shortcuts are obviously different on Windows. Command plus will zoom in on the, uh, on the document. Again, to make it a little bit easier to figure out uh, what exactly is going, going on with the document uh, if you want. So command minus or command zero, which does uh, fit into uh, into the window. 
That's uh, two relatively small features, but if you're using PDF Toolbox desktop a lot, um, they actually do make it much easier to work with uh, PDF documents inside of uh, desktop. So welcomed additions to the product uh, as far as I'm concerned. The third item that I had on my slide, libraries, is not to talk about the library feature itself. Uh, if you remember, if I go to profiles, I can uh, click at the top here to open the list with libraries that I have in my PDF toolbox and then I can uh, switch to a, a different set of libraries in there. Um, the reason I have that on my slide is this feature has been in PDF Toolbox since PDF Toolbox 8, so it was introduced in, uh, in 8.1, I think, to be exact. Um, but the, the actual library that is delivered with uh, profiles and checks and fix-ups hasn't changed for, for many years. And that means that if you do a fresh install of PDF Toolbox, um, you end up with a, a library that contains a very long list of uh, checks, fixes, and profiles, and sometimes they were not quite up to date. It made it uh, more difficult to find specific examples and so on. So in PDF Toolbox 9, what happened is that you now have a number of libraries that are installed, and all of those libraries have been uh, cleaned up and uh, so it should be much easier to find examples of what you want to accomplish. The one you're looking at here, shapes, variables, JavaScript, and place content, is one of those default libraries that is shipped with the product. Of course, you still have full control. You can go to manage libraries, and you can um, uh, delete any of the libraries you have in there. You could export them. Uh, you could import an old library. So you still have full control over what goes on, but that list that you had in there has been cleaned up quite significantly, and hopefully you will find your way a little bit easier in what gets installed in PDF Toolbox 9. The full list of everything that was installed in PDF Toolbox 8 will still be available, so if there is anything that you uh, desperately want from that list and you don't have it anymore in your copy, we'll make uh, that available for download uh, so that you can simply import that in, uh, in PDF Toolbox. Another small thing, but again, a very welcome uh, change in PDF Toolbox 9, I think. It feels like I'm trying to fill up uh, my time with small features, but I'm actually absolutely not. Uh, it will be difficult to uh, get through this, so I'll, uh, I'll start uh, getting on with it. Um, to come back to that library uh, story that I told, this is the list of those libraries that you will see in a new copy, so if you install PDF Toolbox 9. Uh, so the starter kits, which are the basic examples, then uh, everything that has to do with PDF standards, a library that focuses on prepress color transparency, the one I already mentioned that has many of the more advanced features, we still need to talk about shapes and variables and, uh, and so on, um, and then device link is a, a separate library that has all of the device link profiles that you can use if you have the device link add-on option in PDF Toolbox. So that will be the new list of libraries that you have inside of uh, PDF Toolbox 9. Let's go to the next uh, item, and the next item is uh, CXF. And in order to uh, start talking about that, well, let me give some background on CXF uh, uh, to begin with, uh, perhaps. Uh, if you do not know what CXF is, that's not really a bad thing. Uh, it is something that definitely will still needs to grow in terms of adoption, both by software and uh, in, uh, in workflows. Uh, CXF stands for uh, Color Exchange Format, and it's, uh, meanwhile, an ISO standard. Uh, you see the uh, very uh, cryptic ISO number up there as well. And the goal of CXF is to provide um, a format in which you can store color information. 
more specifically spectral data for uh, colors. And uh, what we're talking about here, the CXF that uh, comes into play when you think about PDF documents, is uh, very specifically CXF uh, data that has to do with spot colors. Now, if you normally have a PDF document and you have spot colors in that PDF document, there is some information in there that says what color that particular spot color has. And depending on the, uh, the, the libraries, for example, uh, HKS or Pantone libraries that have been used, um, the information could be um, LA, an LAB value for the spot color at 100% or a CNYK value or even an RGB value. But that's the only piece of information that you have in that PDF document. That CXF information goes much further. That is typically spectral data that is measured from that printed spot color on top of uh, white, so on top of the medium itself, if you want, and then the same spot color printed on a black process color. Um, so those, all of that spectral information is uh, uh, added in uh, the CXF document, and that CXF document is then added into the output intent of the PDF. Now, that sounds very abstract, but let me uh, take a file that has a CXF file inside. So I just take this one here, and what you can see is that at the bottom, where you also find the PDFX4 tag uh, in PDF Toolbox, there is now a CXF tag uh, as well. And if I click that, I get a window that shows me the actual CXF data, that's XML data that you're looking at in here, shows me the CXF data stored inside of this particular document. And at the bottom, you can see for which spot colors that CXF data has been uh, embedded in this particular document. So if I go to silver, um, it will tell me here sil silver ink characterization. Uh, if I go to uh, orange, it uh, tells me orange ink. And then in each case, I have, if I look at the very end, I have measurements of each time from zero to 100% printed on top of the substrate and printed on top of uh, process black. Now, why would you store that information in there? Well, you would store that information in there because having that CXF information can make it easier to do things like proofing. If you want to do proofing for a, a PDF uh, document, so if you want to generate a good proof, then you, uh, you can do a better job if you know exactly how the spot colors in the file will behave. And that CXF information provides you exactly that. Having the spectral data for all of these spot colors makes it possible to create a much better proof. Um, what can you do with PDF Toolbox other than viewing that XML, which probably you're uh, not interested uh, in, well, um, if I uh, look here, uh, you'll see that uh, there are a number of uh, additional uh, checks. So let me very quickly open this up and uh, look for CXF. You can see that there are a number of things that you can check for in that PDF document that have to do with CXF. And the most common thing that you would, uh, would do, you'll find uh, actually a default profile in that color library that I talked about before that is installed with PDF Toolbox 9. The, the most obvious thing that you would like to do is A, make sure that there is CXF data in the file, that it is valid CXF data, and that you have CXF information for all of the spot colors that you have in the document. Okay, um, I'm not going to do much more than that other than showing you that if you go to the switchboard and you go to uh, pre-press, there is also CXF uh, area in there where you can extract the CXF information or simply remove it if you know that it's not needed 
or if you have a library of uh, CXF data, then uh, you could use PDF Toolbox to also embed it in the PDF document and make sure that it is available for the rest of the workflow. So it might very well be that your tools do not support uh, this use of CXF yet, but we think that this is something that is going to increase quite a bit um, over the coming, uh, coming years, and we thought it was important to already have support in there for uh, in, in PDF Toolbox. Like I said, proofing is an obvious area where you will see uh, this used. Color conversion is another area where this uh, information is very useful. If I want to convert a spot color to CNYK, um, then having better information about the spot color will help me to do better conversion to CNYK uh, and minimize the delta E that you get while doing that conversion. Okay, something completely different. Uh, again, something relatively small, but very, very useful. Uh, and that is the ability to count hits. And what do I mean with that? Well, um, here's a very good example. In some cases, uh, you have a need to identify pages that are too complex in a PDF document. Uh, perhaps because the RIP you're using uh, has trouble with that, and that could be an old RIP. It could also be that you're using these PDFs on mobile devices and you want to make sure that they render quickly, so you need to find these complex pages. And one of the things that we've seen is that if there are a lot of uh, complex objects, like smooth shade objects, or even just a whole lot of vector objects in a file, that then the, the display time or the ripping time uh, increases significantly. How do I? How do you identify those pages and then do something uh, with that? Well, in PDF Toolbox 9, and I will immediately show you uh, how that works. In PDF Toolbox 9, uh, you have a solution for that. This is a, a document that uh, shows the problem quite nicely. So this is a, a very simple uh, document. But if you, and you can already uh, see that, if you scroll through the document, you'll notice that uh, some of the pages in that particular document take much longer to render than other pages. Why? Well, because you have a page in here. If I zoom in, it will also take a while. Uh, because these pages are uh, probably built in Visio or something like that. There is a background in that page, and that background is constructed from a whole lot of very, very tiny uh, elements. In this case, vector elements that all need to be rendered, and as such, it takes a long time to uh, display this page. Now, what can I do about that? Well, if I go to my uh, checks, um, you will see that I have a check that I prepared that says detect pages with more than 10,000 vector objects. Right now in PDF Toolbox 8, there is no way to do that. You have to generate an XML report and then do a bunch of scripting to figure out what's going on. In PDF Toolbox 9, there is a new condition that you can add to a check, and you can see that here. Uh, it's called number of hits in this uh, check. And if you add this to um, a pre-flight check, then that pre-flight check is only going to give a hit, a pre-flight error, if the total number of objects that uh, satisfies the other conditions in this check um, is matched. So in this case, I'm saying only trigger a hit if there are more than or equal to 10,000 objects. What objects? Well objects that are vector objects. So whatever pre-flight check you build, as soon as you add this check or this condition to that pre-flight check, you immediately have something that will only react if, what you, if that condition that you build is reached more than that amount of times or less than that amount of times or equal to. So you, can, you have all the regular uh, comparison operators that you normally can use in a pre-flight check. What does that mean? Well, it means that if I run this on the uh, on the document, that um, I will get only one hit, one pre-flight uh, error. 
and uh, that's because I only have one uh, page in there that has more than 10,000 objects. So only for that one page with 10,000 objects do I get that uh, hit. So if I look, um, all of the uh, items that I get here are for page number four. So that is the page where I get that uh, complexity. Now, this is nice, but uh, it's not everything. What I could do now is I could build a, um, where did I put that? Here, convert complex pages to image. So I could build a fix up and that fix up now uses my new pre-flight check. So uh, this is a fix up that will raster a page into an image. And I'm asking here for a CYK, JPEG, simulate overprint, and so on. So this would normally raster all pages in the document. In this case, I'm using this detection of complex pages check. And if I run this on my uh, document, and we'll do that conversion, then this rasterization of the page into an image is only going to happen for uh, those pages that are found to be complex. And again, this still takes a little bit of time because it is counting all of the objects on that very complex page. But once that you go through this uh, fix up, you'll end up with a file that displays much faster because any a page that contains more than 10,000 vector objects will have been converted into an uh, image. Just give it another, uh, another second. This is, of course, exactly why you want to do the conversion in the first place, because if you uh, take this document and you try to view it on uh, an iPad or an iPhone, for example, it will probably take five minutes to, uh, to render that, uh, that single page in there simply because it is so uh, complex. As you can see, um, the fix-up now tells me that it converted uh, into an image, but it only did that once. So it only did it for uh, one page. This, these first pages that I have here are still uh, text. The last page that I now have is an uh, image, as you can see. And of course, the resolution at which, at which this has been uh, rendered is dependent on the um, is dependent on what you set as as uh, as options in that pre-flight uh, check and fix up and so on. So you can define what you call complex. You can also define uh, at what resolution the page has to be uh, rasterized. Okay. Um, I will skip these because I just showed it in uh, PDF Toolbox itself. And that brings us to one of the larger topics in here, and that is a large format print. So let me go back to PDF Toolbox and go to the switchboard again. And then in the switchboard, I have this new section called large format uh, printing. And what do I have in there? Well, I have a number of um, uh, features that typically are needed to do job finishing in large format workflows. And by no means do we claim to handle every complex finishing uh, job that you may have in large, form, large format workflows here, because those tend to be uh, very complex in some cases as well. But in many cases, what you want to do is relatively uh, simple. And let me, uh, let me highlight some of these. The first one, and this is a very common one, is that in many cases, and that may be, for example, because you're printing on a transparent uh, material, uh, you uh, want to add an ink layer. So um, either you want to add a white, in the background or the foreground, depends on the, uh, the printing order. Uh, you may want to add uh, a varnish or something else. And PDF Toolbox now has the ability to, to do that. I'm not going to show this with a document because this is part of larger functionality shapes that we're going to talk about in about five minutes. But I do simply want to show you that you can do this in the, uh, in the switchboard. You also have some options. So I can add ink everywhere in the trim box, for example, or 
I can add it everywhere where I already have objects or everywhere where I don't have objects on the page. And that depends what type of ink you're, uh, you're adding and for which type of job you're, uh, you're doing this, of course. Uh, so more about this in about uh, five minutes when we talk about shapes. Then add borders gives you the ability to add white space around the document. So if I have uh, a banner, this would allow me to add, I don't know, five centimeters at the top and the bottom of the document. And those, uh, those areas that you add would be uh, white space. Um, you can outline the, uh, the trim box so that you have a fold outline, for example. But the next area then, uh, allows me to add bleed. So I could add white space in a first step to make sure that I have room for the bleed I need in a document and then I can add bleed. And now it becomes very interesting and I want to at least show you a little bit of what is uh, going on. Let's use the banner for this. So uh, this is a banner and what I can ask for now is uh, to have bleed created uh, on here. And uh, I can specify how much, uh, top, bottom, left, and, uh, and right, uh, units, of course. And then, and this is where it becomes interesting, I can specify what the way is in which the bleed needs to be added. PDF Toolbox 8, there was basically one, one possibility, and that was mirror as image. And that means that the whole page is uh, created uh, as an image, is converted into an image. So it's rasterized, and then that image is used to add bleed around the, uh, around the document. Now, depending on the kind of document that you have, that's not always the best option because it can cause uh, uh, visual differences. You're, you're looking at actual objects, but in the bleed, it's a, a rasterized version, a rastered version of those same objects, so that's not the same. You also, when you start doing color conversions or uh, controlling color uh, with documents like that, uh, you might have a difference in the way the color conversion is done for the example for this banner, uh, the way the color conversion is done for the smooth shade that you have here in the background and for the image that you have for the bleed. So that's not always a, a really good uh, option. So in PDF Toolbox 9, we give you two other options. The first one is repeat as pixel, and if I uh, just run that for a second, you'll see that what it did now is add uh, this 50 millimeters of uh, bleed around the document. It really added 50 millimeters of bleed. This is a very big document uh, that I have here because it's a banner. Um, so it, it adds that, that, that bleed, and in this case, I chose repeat last pixel, so it looks at what the last pixel is at the edge of the trim, and then it simply repeats that out. And for this type of banner, that's an ideal way to deal uh, with that. And actually, uh, in many cases, uh, for banners and billboards and so on, where you have a background image, uh, this is not a bad way of, uh, of dealing with it. Of course, it's not the only thing I can do. I can uh, still go for the mirroring technique, but then probably I want to um, use not the image version, but I want to simply mirror the page objects. And if I do uh, that, what I get is a mirror uh, of the actual smooth shade that I have around the document. And, um, this will, in most cases, give you the, um, the best quality that you can have while you're generating uh, bleed. Now, in the switchboard, the implementation is relatively simple and straightforward. If you uh, go look at the fix-up itself, once you have the demo version, you'll see that there are some other interesting options. Uh, for example, I can generate a, a mirror of the uh, actual page objects but ignore text objects, because if there is text that comes too close to the page edge, the text is typically not something that you want to, uh, you want to mirror, that would be weird. So uh, you can create a fix up in such a way that uh, only the background objects would be used to create that bleed uh, in, uh, in, in this fashion. So, that much for uh, bleed. Now, if I have a document and I can uh, simply use what I have here, 
Uh, in many cases, you also want to add markers for uh, grommets, eyelets. Uh, both uh, terms are, uh, are used. And there are two ways to do that in the switchboard. I, I can specify how much spacing I need between grommets, or I can simply specify how many uh, grommets I, uh, I want. And I will put them right at the trim box here. And let's say that I want uh, four and maybe eight uh, there. Run that, and um, we'll see what that does. There you go. So what it did now, I didn't specify any margin. Uh, I had a, a zero margin at, at, at all sides. So now it puts the uh, grommets exactly centered on the trim box around the document, but with that margin you can put them inside the trim box, outside the trim box, whatever you need for a particular uh, workflow. Okay, again there is a fix-up version from uh, for this where you can where you could have even more control if you see something that isn't exactly the way you want, you can then customize that fix-up. The fix-up for grommets uh, works uh, based on the place content uh, feature that was introduced in PDF Toolbox 8, so it's uh, it's very very flexible and can be adjusted uh, exactly to what you uh, what you need. The last thing that you very often want to do in large format is what is called tiling, and tiling means that the the, the document I have here is too big. In this case, you're looking at a five meter by three meter uh, billboard size uh, document. And if it is that big, it might not. You might not be able to print it uh, in that uh, in, in in that format. So what I can do is say I want to cut this document in pieces so that each piece can be uh, printed, and then I can say how it needs to be constructed. So whoever constructs it uh, needs to start at the left and then um, uh, add pieces to the right. And just for fun, let's say that he needs to stop to start at the bottom and then work his way up, so bottom to top. And I'm going to add uh, a construction page. That's usually very, uh, very useful to know which piece goes uh, where. And the, the other thing I specified here is the size of the pieces. In this case, each piece is two meters, and uh, I've specified how much overlap I want. If I'm handling um, pieces of uh, paper, heavy paper that are two meters by two meters, it's going to be very difficult to uh, put them exactly next to each other. Um, this overlap is there so that you can uh, you can glue one piece on top of the other. You have some margin so that it's not very noticeable if the fit is not exactly correct. So run that on um, my documents and uh, save. And what this generates is uh, a first page with that construction information. As you can see, it shows a preview of the complete document. Then it also shows that same preview, but with an overlay of the actual tiles that are going to be created. Uh, we asked start uh, at the left and start at the bottom. So the bottom left hand tile is number one, that is a two meter tile, I have another two meter tile, and then the third tile is whatever was left, and then the same at the top, it takes whatever was left. If I go to the, to the second page in this document, um, I get the actual tile itself, and so all of the other pages are the tiles that will be printed uh, on here. And if I uh, zoom in a little bit, and we go to, uh, this is a large document, I shouldn't have zoomed in that much. If I zoom in, you can see that at the bottom of each tile, you have the name of the tile, uh, which tile this is, the dimensions, and let me see if this one has them. Of course not, this is the last one. Uh, if I go to one of the other ones, uh, here. So what you can see, the, the little line that you see here at the left-hand side and the right-hand side is the glue line. So this is where the next piece uh, has to be added on top of what is already there. And then uh, you also see the, the tile number 
uh, that is being added. And uh, that this is added in the document, but this is the part that will be glued over. So uh, that's not a uh, that's not a problem. Okay, so that is uh, tiling, and that concludes the large format uh, section. Uh, all of these features are based on fix-ups, so you can modify them and include them in a profile, with the exception of tiling, that's a bit of a special case, and we actually internally use PDF chip, uh, the other uh, Kalas product to convert HTML into good printable PDF. We use the PDF chip technology internally to do the conversion from uh, the one big document into a document with uh, all of these different uh, tiles. So that one is not that easily um, uh, changeable in uh, PDF toolbox. So that was already a little bit of a, a bigger uh, feature if you want, and we have two uh, very nice big features to go. Uh, I have another 20 minutes that should uh, just work perhaps. So let's see, shapes is the next one, and I already talked about shapes. When I talked about the uh, the switchboard and said you can add an ink layer, uh, that is actually uh, using or done using the shapes technology. But shapes is much, much more flexible than simply adding uh, ink layers. The idea is that, and I will show you some examples uh, in a second, but the idea is that you can define a, an abstract shape, and that can be based on the trim box or another page box. It can be based on all of the page objects you have in the file. It can be based on um, the, a certain type of vector element that you have in the file. Uh, so that's the first step. You define what shape you want to use. You can combine these shapes together to create more complex forms. And then in the second step, you tell PDF Toolbox what you want to do with them. And that could be uh, adding um, uh, a filled uh, shape on top, so adding an ink layer, for example. It could be adding a stroked outline of that shape. It could be clipping whatever is there. So very interesting uh, technology in that sense and very, very flexible. Let me show you some examples. And we'll start by something that uh, will make you ask, does it also work with the shapes that are non-rectangular, but I can assure you that it does. Let me start with this one. This is very simple. So what I want to do here is I want to add varnish over the images. This needs to be printed, and I want the images to be nicely glossy, so I want to add a varnish layer on top. How do I do that? Well, I have this uh, very nice uh, fix up here. Let me run that and show the results. There you go. So what happened here? Well, uh, everywhere where I have an image, there is now an additional rectangle that gets uh, got added. Let me go to separations to show you uh, what that what I mean. So I have this new separation here called varnish, and if I look at the varnish separation, uh, that is 100% ink in this case. Everywhere where I have an image. Yeah, so that's exactly what I was uh, what I was looking for. That's one. But of course, this is perhaps not so uh, difficult yet. But you can already see something else interesting. The, the varnish layer is actually bigger than the images itself. So not only can you define a shape based on the objects you have on the page, but I can also either make that shape smaller than the object or larger than the object. And in this case, uh, it was uh, larger that was uh, uh, selected. The terminology that is often used is a choke and spread for these two operations. So this one has been spread by a certain amount. Uh, this is based on a, uh, on a fix up and I hesitate to show you the fix up because I don't have much time, but I will very briefly. Um, as I said, the fix up consists out of two parts. First, I create the shape, so I define what type of shape I want. And in this case, I'm, uh, I'm doing that based on the page content, but then uh, with a pre-flight check that uh, will look only at the images in the document. And then in a second step, I apply the shape. And apply, in this case, is stroked and filled. And then I have a whole bunch of parameters that I can fill in 
for the spot color name, whether it needs to be on the layer, what the actual color equivalents are, and so on and so on. So that's how that works, but let's not complicate things, and I will just show you one other example here. Uh, adding something on top of, uh, of images is, uh, like I said, relatively easy because you're talking about a bunch of uh, rectangular uh, shapes in here. Um, and while I'm while I'm saying this, uh, there I, I can see a question that just popped up that says, "Can you add a shape based on all of the objects on the particular layer?" Yes, the answer is yes. You can influence which objects are uh, being added to uh, by using a preflight check. And what I used here was a preflight check that says, "Detect all of the images." You could easily modify that to detect all of the images that are on a particular layer or just detect any object that is on a particular layer with a particular layer name. So those things are, are definitely possible. But what I wanted to show here is the, the opposite. So what if I want to have something, and maybe it's varnish again or it's something else, uh, when I want to have something everywhere except for the images. Well, that's just as uh, easy, of course. I've given it a different color in this case, but you can see, and it's very clear here, at this image that has a lot of white in it, it's very clear that uh, we've now added a layer everywhere where there are no uh, images. And again, looking at the separations, if I go to varnish, uh, in this case, I created a mask where all of the images were, uh, were not covered. So that's, uh, that's quite uh, easy. But of course, I, we're still working with rectangular uh, shapes. I know that, and it's, uh, it's easy to think that um, you will only be able to do this with rectangular shapes. So let me show you something that is uh, a little bit more uh, difficult. Uh, I need a file here, more penguins, of course. So here we go. Um, this one is, uh, it's actually a, a, a relatively random image uh, focused on the, uh, on, on, the, on the penguin, not on the background. Uh, so it's a relatively random image that I, uh, that I f uh, uh, found on the internet, actually bought on the internet. It's a stock photo. And the background is a spot color, uh, a blue spot color. So what I want to do now is I want to have only that uh, penguin and not the background. And don't ask me why, that's just what I need. So I'm going to do that with shapes. Again, it's a simple fix up. And there you go. So what I did in this case, just to show you that this is not uh, some kind of magic, what I did in this case was again the same thing. So I'm looking at um, the page content, including white areas in there. Um, but in this case, I'm looking at all objects in the file except for the spot color that is used as the background. And then I'm using that shape to clip whatever is there. So that shape that was traced around the penguin is then used as a clipping mask. And that's why the background disappears around the uh, penguin. Now, to make it more interesting, uh, what you very uh, often will want to do, if I want to print this as a label, uh, an adhesive label, for example, then I will need a white behind this uh, penguin, or it's going to look very transparent, and penguins don't like that. So. What I can do is use the same shape technology again, but this time I'm going to add an ink in the background of my document. It's going to be called white, and it's going to be spread out. So it's, you're, you're going to see it appear a little bit from underneath the uh, penguin image that I have. So we just need to do our magic here. There you go. So again, um, it took the, it calculated what the actual shape is that I wanted, then it spread that out by five millimeters, and it's adding that as an additional spot color uh, called uh, white. Now, a question that was asked, can I use this to duplicate an, a vector element and then maybe make a, make a cut contour about from that? Of course, I could have done the same thing here, and I could have said, add a stroke uh, around this penguin image and call that, give that a spot color name 
uh, cut contour or die line or whatever it is in your workflow, and that would add a vector element around my label that can then be used by a, a cutting table. So that would uh, that would be very possible. Uh, because this is so cool, let me just show you one more example, and then we'll we'll call it quits, I think. Um, but I have this uh, this file here. So this again is a demo file, uh, of course. Um, now, in this case, the, you can see that there is no trim box. Well, there is, but it's the same as the media box, so, which is very annoying because the label is actually uh, in, in, in there. Uh, the, the, the information that you have around it is, is just production information. I don't want that. So let's, let, me, let me say that I want to create a cut contour for this, and it's a label, so I want a, a cut contour that has nicely rounded, um, rounded corners but of course, the, the cut contour should be on the actual content, right? I'm going to do that in two steps here. The first step is that I'm going to set the trim box. And uh, I always had fixes to, to handle trim box in PDF Toolbox. In PDF Toolbox 9, that trim box can be, held, can be dealt with, with, it can actually use that shape technology as well. So what I can do is say, fix, I'll call that test again. So uh, again, it, it used the shape technology to examine the file, uh, look for the bounding box of all of the objects that are not using spot color all in this case. Uh, all of this production information is using spot color all. And it sets the trim box exactly where I want it to be. Now, that doesn't give me a cut contour, but it gives me a trim box by itself. And I could skip this, it's a nice demo, but I could skip this step even if I don't, uh, if I don't need it. Um, what I want is a die line on there, and I want that in the same location, maybe a little bit inset in there, so uh, a little bit inside of my trim box. And like I said, I want it with rounded corners. And in the example that I created here, it's, um, uh, it's, it's not a solid line, usually for a trim box, it should be, or for a, a, a cut contour, it should be a solid line. In this case, it's a, a, a dashed line, simply to show that that is a possibility as well, and to highlight where it, uh, where it is. So let me run that last piece of magic. And uh, as you can see, that gave me this dashed line inside of, I think it's inset by one or two millimeters, inside of the trim box. And this is now using a, uh, a spot color. Spot color is, is called cut contour. And this could be used to then uh, send to a, a cutting device or do whatever you need uh, with that. So this shape technology is very, very flexible. You'll, you'll see that when you start playing with it. Um, and in, in every case, it allows you to create a shape, either a simple one like what I have here or a more complex one where you combine multiple shapes and you only look at the intersection of all of that. Um, so you can create a shape and then you can use the shape to add an ink layer, to add vector elements, to add, um, uh, to use as a clipping path. Uh, all of those things are uh, possibilities. Really cool technology. Okay, I'm not going to make it by five. I already know that now, but that's okay. Um, I'll do my best. The last part is variables, and it's uh, also a, a pretty large uh, part, a very big feature if you want. Very, very flexible um, again, but a little bit more technical, and I'll, I'll try to stay away from some of the technicalities and show you what it or at least hint at what it can do instead. Let me go to my presentation for a second. You all know, or you all should know, variables. They have been part of PDF Toolbox for a very long time, uh, as of uh, PDF Toolbox nine, uh, 4, I believe. So that's uh, quite, a, quite a number of years now. But um, historically, for all kinds of reasons, there were some limitations with variables and where you could use them. And that is the first thing that has been solved in, um, in PDF Toolbox 9. Uh, in PDF Toolbox 8 and before, you could use variables in selected um, edit fields. So everywhere where you uh, typed in a value, 
you could also use a variable instead. In PDF Toolbox 9, you can use variables almost everywhere. So also for uh, pull-down menus and checkboxes, uh, severity, so you can use a variable to determine whether a fix, um, sorry, a pre-flight check is going to be logged as an error, a warning, or an informational item, uh, or whether it's going to be uh, logged at all, of course. So all of these places where you could not use variables before, uh, you now have the ability to uh, use those variables. And let me see if I can uh, show you a very uh, quick uh, example of that. So if I go to uh, this here and uh, yep, so in this uh, color uh, convert fix up that I have in my list here, uh, you can see that uh, I have the same settings as what I had for PDF Toolbox 8. You can also see these uh, orange uh, arrows here. These orange arrows now allow me to specify a variable for each that controls each of these elements. So even the, uh, the checkboxes can be controlled by uh, a variable. And I have this um, profile pop-up here that as well can be controlled by a variable now. And uh, in fact, there is a variable in here, so I can go uh, into that orange arrow and then say edit um, that variable. And a variable can be a simple value, that's what we had as choice before, and it can be a script, and I'll come back to that in the, in the next example. Uh, in this case, it's a very simple value, so it's still um, a, a string if you want, but this variable actually understands that it is used in a list of ICC profiles. And so if I click on this information button that I have here, it shows me the list of all of the ICC profiles and I can select one of the items in that list. Even better, I could control what someone is capable of selecting here. So I could say, for example, that uh, in this case, I only want a couple of the profiles um, to be able to be uh, to be used, and then uh, when I say OK, and we say OK, and I uh, run this fix up, then what you get is um, a dialog box that asks you what should the value be of these variables. That's the same as what you had in PDF Toolbox 8, but Contrary to what you had in PDF Toolbox 8, I now have a pull-down menu that allows me to choose from the values that were allowed by whoever created this uh, fix-up. Uh, so in this case, I can only select from the three values that I, uh, that I have uh, allowed. Okay, so this is a very uh, simple example of what you can do with variables. Let me show you something else. And uh, this time we are talking about the scripting part. So having these variables everywhere is really, really useful. But there is still a lot of things that you cannot do. And we felt that you could not make profiles as smart as you needed them to be sometimes. And um, I have a, a very good example here. Uh, this is um, yeah, just a file. Uh, it has some space at the bottom, as you can see. And what I want to do is I want to add um, uh, either, I want to add the file name, for example, uh, to the bottom of the document. And it uh, turns out that I, uh, that I can. So if I run this fix up and we call this uh, tests, there, it added a file name at the bottom of this document. And if I run another fix up, And uh, yeah, we'll just overwrite that, that's okay. If I uh, run this, uh, this new fix up, it actually adds a uh, barcode, uh, code uh, 128 uh, barcode to the document. And if I uh, look at that, so if we go look at that barcode, 
you can see that what gets added as the barcode, so what is encoded in this barcode, is again actually the name of uh, the file that was, uh, that was processed. So how do you do that? Well, in PDF2 box 8, you could also do that, but doing this involved writing your own place content template, which probably would take you four hours to, uh, to do, because it's a, at least the first time, it's a, it's a template, you need to use JavaScript, um, and you need to learn how this HTML uh, stuff and so on works inside of PDF Toolbox. Uh, with PDF Toolbox 9, it became a lot simpler. So let's look at the at document name as barcode fix up. If I open this one up, this is the simple place content uh, fix up to add barcodes. And what it does is it lets you specify what type of barcode lets you specify the font and all of the other parameters, and then it lets you specify what the value is that you want to add. And in this uh, area, in this item, I have added a variable. And if I look at that variable, you'll see that what it does is very simple. It asks PDF Toolbox what the full path is of the document that it's currently processing, and then it does something complex with regular expressions that I got from the internet as well somewhere, so uh, you shouldn't try to reinvent the wheel if it's not necessary. And what this actually does is uh, simply extract the file name from the full path uh, of the, the document. And that is returned to PDF Toolbox. So that's the value of that uh, variable, and that means that encoded in that barcode, um, I have the uh, name of uh, the, the file. So um, having these variables that you can calculate with and that you can do scripting with is very, very convenient for uh, many different uh, applications. And as you, as you could see, it's relatively simple uh, as well. I have uh, this variable that uh, either has a simple value or it has a script value. And um, if I uh, go in there, uh, I have some different things that can help me, including JavaScript help, because what we're using here, and that's important to realize, what we're using here is, of course, not something that Kalas invented, but it's plain JavaScript. Um, so, uh, again, the only thing you need is a little bit of an understanding from uh, JavaScript to take the, some of the examples that uh, that we have and modify those or to create your own uh, idea. So you have an introduction to how to use this JavaScript uh, in here. You have some other things that can help you in here. Uh, I can also uh, insert a JavaScript object. So this shows you what the information is that you can get from a document, for example, and then you can see that it actually goes pretty far. You can you can ask PDF Toolbox not just what the, the path is or the file name is, you can also ask for the page box, you can ask for uh, document info, creator, producer, and so on. You can ask for metadata, so I can actually get the complete XMP metadata from a document and get something from the XMP, for example. So adding something that is stored in the XMP in the document and adding that into a barcode would definitely be, uh, be possible as well. So you have a long list of um, things that you can get from the document and then you can also specify your own variables, look at variables that are defined somewhere else, um, require that a particular variable is, uh, is necessary and will be asked to the user and so on and so on. So these variables are, and this is in summary what you should remember, I think, they're usable everywhere within uh, PDF Toolbox. Uh, I was going to uh, stop this, but I actually need to show you one more thing where this is uh, usable. Um, let me go to um, this process plan, and I'm just going to show you that this exists. Uh, actually, not that one, I want a complex one. I'm just going to show you that this exists, and I'm not going to go into the uh, the details. I think we'll need to do a separate webinar at some point to uh, to go into uh, that. Uh, but as you can see in the process plan, you could always add checks and fix-ups and uh, uh, profiles and so on. 
you can now also build um, specific variable steps in there and that could be in this case for example there is a check and this script that is inserted in the process plan is used to evaluate what that check found and then prepare everything so that the fix-up that follows it does the right thing uh, in, in the document. So it's another place where this can be used. So these variables can be used throughout the application. In, in most cases where you have fix-ups and checks and, uh, and profiles, you can use variables. And uh, the other thing you need to remember is that um, you, can, you now have JavaScript, and having JavaScript lets you do all kinds of interesting things. I had one other example that I'm not going to show because I'm already uh, over the time I had uh, allotted but there was one other example where uh, in large format for example you could say I want to build a profile where the customer says this is a viewing distance of uh, what I'm designing and all of the other checks in the profile derive information from that so if I check for point size I could say that well if the viewing distance is 10 meters because it's a billboard then the point size should be much bigger the minimum point size because otherwise no one can can read what is on there but the resolution should also be lower because you're looking at it from further away and you don't need very high resolution print but that could be one setting that a user has to select in the profile so saying what the viewing distance is and all of the other checks in the profile can then be cal can calculate what they need depending on that viewing distance variable so this leads the way to very, very flexible um, uh, integrations. Okay, if you have any questions, now would be a very good time to, uh, to, to, to ask them. I'm just going to uh, remind you of what we have seen here. So this uh, wireframe zoom and then uh, libraries, CXF, um, color exchange format uh, that is uh, supported now. Uh, this additional functionality to count how many objects you have on a page while you're doing pre-flight, uh, all of the options we've seen for large format print, including grommets and ink layers and uh, uh, new ways to generate bleeds and uh, tiling and all of those things. Very cool shape technology to define shapes and then use them to add ink layers or do clipping or add vector elements and so on. And then um, uh, the new variable support that allows you to define variables uh, just about everywhere in a, a profile, uh, but also calculate with variables by the use of uh, JavaScript. Last item, perhaps, uh, this is the commercial slide, but you can actually more or less forget this one because it's exactly the same as what you know for PDF Toolbox 8. Prices have not changed, the upgrade prices have not changed, and for most of you, uh, if you're using the uh, the server, the CLI or the SDK, and you have uh, you've been good and you have an active maintenance agreement, we always advise you to have an active maintenance agreement. Uh, if you have that, then the upgrade is uh, included in the price of the maintenance. So you basically get this uh, for uh, for free. We are already talking to our resellers. Um, and looking at maintenance agreements and so on. So you should be receiving uh, new keys or new license information pretty quickly for uh, PDF Toolbox 9. If you don't have an active SMA, uh, get in contact with the partner, the reseller or the integrator that you bought PDF Toolbox from. If you no longer know that or it's someone who isn't in, in business anymore or uh, something like that, then simply contact um, 4Ps directly and we'll help you figure out uh, what the deal is. Uh, very simple, info at 4Ps.com or sales at 4Ps.com and uh, that question will uh, get routed to the correct person. In terms of uh, availability, I'm sure that uh, I haven't looked at all of the questions yet, but I'm sure someone will ask at some point. What are we today? Tuesday, actually, we started doing communication today to our partners, so resellers, uh, system integrators, and so on. Uh, you should have uh, been receiving some information about that. Uh, normally, the uh, final release will be on Thursday, so that's uh, two days from now. 
um, and uh, at that point you'll get links, you will get um, uh, information uh, in PDF Toolbox 8 actually that there is a new uh, release and then uh, you can download it that way. Let me add one word of caution perhaps. Um, this is of course a major release of uh, PDF Toolbox. Please do not install this in your production environment without testing whether it works. Um, we all know, of course, that PDF Toolbox has no problems whatsoever, um, but God forbid that uh, one would have slipped through the QA that uh, Kalas does. Um, simply install PDF Toolbox next to what you're running today that should not influence your version 8 or version 7. Uh, install it next to it, test it out, and only do that switch when you have tested your workflows with uh, version 9. We don't expect many troubles. Uh, there are no uh, big new libraries embedded in PDF Toolbox, as it was the case with PDF Toolbox 8, for example, but still better saved than sorry, do some uh, testing. This is a major uh, upgrade. Okay, um, let me just go back to, uh, I'll put my email address on here as well, uh, but let me go back to my questions and see um, what we have left here. Uh, metadata, those are the metadata of the file. I'm assuming that you're referring to uh, variables, uh, Pascal. Uh, and in that case, you are correct. So if you have um, a JavaScript in one of those variables that you use, you can actually access the document info and the XMP metadata of the file that is being processed. Uh, so that means that uh, you could get a, a job ID or anything else from the XMP metadata, for example, and then do whatever you need to do uh, with that. Is only JavaScript available or can you script with PHP? I'm sorry, Doug, it is only uh, JavaScript that has been built in. The decision for JavaScript is, is it's, it's never an easy one. You know that uh, I, uh, I do PHP as well. Uh, so which language to use is always a bit of a, is a, bit of a yeah, decision you have to take at some point. Uh, because we also have uh, PDF chip and we have this uh, report technology and we have place content that are all based on HTML and JavaScript, we decided for variables to also use JavaScript inside. Uh, and that is also because there, it, it, it's, it's very easy with the environment that we use for PDF Toolbox to integrate JavaScript support in it. So uh, unfortunately, there is no support for PHP. It's only the uh, JavaScript. Um, how does this integrate with, uh, with Switch? Actually, the integration with Switch doesn't really differ. Uh, you can still um, uh, take information from within your Switch environment and pass that along to variables in a profile, for example, but then your profile can also have these JavaScripts inside that do further calculation. So where in the past all of the intelligence had to be in switch. Uh, so if you wanted to calculate something or, or derive something, you had to do that in switch. You didn't have another option. Um, today, you, you have that option and you could choose to do some of that work inside of the profile if that makes uh, more sense. The, of course, added benefit is that you don't need something like file train or switch in some cases. Um, you can just use JavaScript inside of uh, the profile. I'm not saying that PDF Toolbox is a replacement of Switch. You know that Switch can do way more, but it gives you some additional flexibility when you're deciding where you are going to implement uh, what. Uh, is it possible to, to define the output folder for a file by using a, var a variable when connecting to the server? No, that is not possible. Um, I understand why you ask that, I think. Uh, today, you would still need to use something like file train or switch to do that kind of uh, uh, automation, David. We are working on, well, I shouldn't say we are working uh, on it, this is future technology and this is not a product announcement, uh, but there are ideas about um, uh, the next step of variables. Uh, 
you can think of what that would be. But one of the ideas is, uh, for example, to process job tickets, uh, where the job ticket would determine uh, what is going to be done, what the input file is perhaps, uh, where the output needs to be saved, what the profile is, and so on. So that is one idea that we've heard from a number of different people. It is on our wish list. Um, I cannot promise you when or if we are going to implement this, but I do know it's on the wish list, and I'll be uh, more than happy to add your name to that uh, feature request. Will you post the KFPX files I used uh, or you used today uh, for you to look at? That's a good question. I actually hadn't thought of that. Um, I think most of the examples will be in the default libraries that you will get. So when you get version 9 and you install it, a lot of those, those things will be in the, um, in the application. But I will have a look whether um, some of those examples that I have now can be shared uh, specifically. In some cases, it's a combination of an example file and an actual profile that you want. And maybe I can make those, those things available. Uh, thank you, Jason. Very good idea. Uh, I'll, uh, I will look into what we need to share uh, from that side. Okay, if um, I'm going to leave it at this, if you had a question that was not answered yet, I will get back to you uh, afterwards. If there is a question you don't want, you don't want to share with the group, uh, just send me an email. You can see my email address there, david at fourpiece.com, or send it to uh, info or support at fourpiece.com. That uh, always works as well. Thank you very much for joining with so many and staying with so many, even though I'm almost 20 minutes late now, I can see. If you run into things that uh, do not work as you uh, thought they would work, or if you have requests, uh, we envision that both for shapes, large formats, and variables, there will be many, many requests uh, for things that we have not thought of. Please send them to us. Uh, we look at all of the requests, and we do implement them as well. Uh, we can't give guarantees, but we take great care in, uh, in listening to what you're, uh, what you're asking for. So please share that with us. If you don't share it, we cannot implement it. The only thing that, uh, that, is, uh, that I'm left with, wishing you a very pleasant rest of uh, the day. Don't, don't dream of shapes and variables tonight. Uh, you'll have uh, your hands on it uh, quickly enough. And uh, I'm sure I will see uh, many of you uh, again in the next webinar. Have a nice day.